What's up guys? Today we're going to talk about corneal abrasions, also known as corneal epithelial defects. The reason being is because this is a very common eye injury and you're going to see this whether you work in emergency medicine, family medicine, or any other subspecialty. In addition, I thought it was important for me to talk about this because when I ask my students to set up for this exam, most of them have no idea how to do the exam or what a corneal abrasion actually even looks like. So with that said, let's talk about how these patients will present, how to do a good eye exam, and how we treat these patients. Corneal abrasions can be defined as a deficit in the epithelial surface of the cornea. However, in order to fully understand where exactly the deficit occurs, let's briefly go over the basic anatomy of the cornea. The cornea is made up of five layers, with the outermost layer being the epithelium. Next, you have the anterior limiting lamina, the stroma, posterior limiting lamina, and the endothelium. Corneal abrasions can occur from a variety of different mechanisms, but can be broken down into traumatic corneal abrasions and spontaneous corneal abrasions. Traumatic corneal abrasions are often caused by fingernails, paws from animals, pieces of paper, makeup applicators, hand tools, tree branches, and even leaves. Basically, anything that has the potential to scratch the eye can cause a traumatic corneal abrasion. In addition, other causes of traumatic corneal abrasions include foreign bodies. Commonly, these are going to be secondary to wood, rust, glass, plastic. These deficits are left behind after the foreign body is removed, causing a deficit to the epithelium of the cornea. Contact lenses can also cause traumatic corneal abrasions when they're taken off. This typically will occur in patients who overwear their lenses, improperly fitting lenses, or fail to clean them properly. Spontaneous corneal abrasions occur in patients that have suffered a previous corneal abrasion. So maybe they had one a couple days ago and it was getting better, but the new tissue sloughed off, predisposing them to recurrent pain and a recurrent abrasion. Other causes of spontaneous abrasions occur in patients with underlying deficits to the corneal epithelium. So now we know what causes this injury, but how will these patients present? These patients will present with a history of direct trauma to the eye via fingernail, tree branch, leaves, etc. They will also be complaining of severe eye pain, photophobia, and a foreign body sensation. In addition, patients with contact-related abrasions will oftentimes tell you that they slept in their contacts and awoke with eye pain and photophobia in the morning and patients with recurrent abrasions will often give the history of waking up in the middle of the night with severe eye pain or pain with first awakening in the morning and opening up their eyes. On physical exam, the most important thing you need to rule out is an open globe injury, especially if they're complaining of pain secondary to trauma. On general inspection, make sure there are no protruding obvious foreign bodies, like a tree hanging out of their eye. Then have the patient open their eye. If they cannot do this on their own, gently pull the lids apart, making sure to not apply pressure to the eye. Using a pen light, then make sure there's no eccentric or teardrop pupil. External prolapse of the uvea, which can be the iris, ciliary body, or chorine. Next, assess the pupillary response, making sure there's no relative afferent pupil deficit, typical of an open globe injury. Confirm the absence of this deficit and look for the normal pupil response in both eyes with a round pupil. Assess the anterior chamber, which in the absence of an open globe injury should appear clear, deep, and of normal contour. Next, take a look at the conjunctiva. Corneal abrasions will have a mild conjunctival ejection or erythema, and oftentimes direct visualization of a foreign body can be seen during the pen light exam. Next, evaluate the extraocular eye movements, which should not elicit any pain or double vision. Then, go ahead and turn off the lights and do the dreaded fundoscopic exam. If nothing else, confirm the red reflex. And finally, you will want to measure visual acuity. In my typical practice, I usually have my nurses do this for me before I even enter the room and enter these numbers into their chart. Now, after you've completed the pen light exam, visual acuity, fundoscopic exam, and ruled out the possibility of an open globe injury, you can now perform the fluorescent scene examination. Tilt the head of the bed back slightly so that the patient is about at a 45 degree angle. Open up their eye gently and instill one drop of tetracaine into the eye of question. Before you do this, make sure you warn the patient that it might burn a little bit. Wait about 10 to 20 seconds and then ask the patient if their pain is gone. Typically, patients with corneal abrasions will have complete relief of the pain after tetracaine and they'll be looking at you like you are the almighty god. Then, insert a fluorescent scene impregnated paper strip into the lower conjunctival sac and have the patient blink multiple times to distribute the dye throughout their eye. The stained abrasion will oftentimes appear yellow to the naked eye, but you will want to enhance your visualization with the use of a woods lamp. Look at the eye thoroughly under the woods lamp. Have the patient look up, 
down, left, and right to visualize the whole eye. If you see no focal uptake, you can rule out this diagnosis. That is because the intact corneal epithelium does not uptake the dye. However, if you see a focal area of uptake, then you know there has been some damage to the corneal epithelium exposing the stromal layer beneath, which is uptaking the dye. Note the size of the deficit and educate your patient that their tears will be yellow for a couple of hours, but will return to normal shortly. Corneal abrasions, once again, will stain yellow. You will also want to make sure that there's no branching or dendritic looking patterns to the uptake that could indicate herpes simplex virus infection. And finally, make sure you're not confusing a corneal ulcer with a corneal abrasion. Corneal ulcers tend to be round on fluorescent seeing stain, but you can typically see them on pen light exam as a white or an opaque spot. Next, now that their eye is numb, flip the upper eyelid to make sure that there's no retained foreign body. Now the moment you've all been waiting for. How do we treat these patients? Topical antibiotics should be given all patients to prevent super infection. Topical ointments are going to be the best because they function as a lubricant and might decrease disruption of the remaining and newly forming epithelium. First line ointment medication will be erythromycin ophthalmic 0.5% four times a day for three to five days. However, this ointment can cause blurry vision and patients might stop using it early due to the side effect. So other options for patients who insist on drops rather than lubricants include sulfacetamide ophthalmic 10%. You can put one to two drops every four hours for three to five days. Other options include polymyxin B, trimethoprim ophthalmic, 10,000 units per milligram, one drop four times a day for three to five days. However, this is extremely important, guys, and it will most likely be a question on your boards. And those patients who are contact lens wearers, you need to give them a medicine that covers for pseudomonas, such as ciprofloxacin, ophthalmic drops, 0.3%. You could put in two drops every four hours for three to five days. Other options include ophiloxin, ophthalmic drops, 0.3%, two drops every four hours for two days, then two drops four times a day for three to five days. You can also use moxifloxacin, ophthalmic, 0.5%, one drop three times a day for three to five days, or gentamicin or tobramycin. Now this is very important as well. If they're having continued symptoms past three days, you need to give them instructions to follow up with an ophthalmologist. Another important loose end to tie up is by the end of your exam, your patients are going to be begging you to prescribe them some of the topical anesthetic drops you put in their eye before you did the fluorescent stain exam. However, you would be wrong to do this because studies show that patients will basically pour this medicine into their eye like a water fountain and the repeated uses cause delays in wound healing, ulceration, scarring, and even blindness. So I typically prescribe Motrin 800 milligrams three times a day and tell them they can take Tylenol over the counter as well. Then I drop this simple fact that they could possibly go blind with repeated uses of topical anesthetic medications and they no longer think I'm a cruel individual for not giving them any more. So that's everything we're going to talk about today. If you're new to the podcast or the YouTube channel, consider subscribing now for notifications each week when our lectures come out. And also, if you have any questions at all, please email me at gray at physicianassistantboards.com. That's G-R-A-Y at physicianassistantboards.com. Until next time.